Hello, everyone. My name is Jura Sirpa Sean Crowley. I'm a software engineer at Grafana Labs. Um, and with me today here, I have Alexandre Magno. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining with us in this session, where we will share some experience about the Open Talent collector, collector, especially in tail sampling feature. Wonderful. So um, we're covering here today a few usage, um, a few use cases of the tail sampling uh, processor for Open Telemetry Collector and um, how Pismo um, used that to reduce their observability costs. Well, uh, our company is under uh, exponential growth, and uh, the cost of observability was grow together. And it uh, was a problem that we need to handle and take some actions to solve this kind of problem. Um, here, the reason that why we need uh, to consider to implement some kind of sampling where our cost of observability traces was growing very fast. So uh, with it in mind, it was necessary to take some actions that we will share more details in the next slides. All right, so um, on this, the next 20 minutes or so, we're sharing uh, what is sampling, um, what are the uh, sampling strategies that we have available to, for us, and why Pismo needed sampling, and how they implemented sampling, what were the outcomes they got, and what holds for the future for uh, Pismo when it comes to sampling. Now, um, when we talk about sampling, we can apply the same ideas or the same uh, concepts to all of the signals, right? So we can apply uh, some sampling strategies for logging. We can apply um, the reduction of data for metrics and for traces. So um, I came up with a very simple definition of what is uh, sampling. And sampling is a technique that we can use to reduce the amount of telemetry data that is generated or stored. Right, so we either generate less data or we store less data. Now, uh, we typically think about tracing when we talk about sampling. And because we have only 20 minutes here, uh, I'm not covering what is uh, sampling for metrics and for logs. We're focusing on, on traces here. And sampling for tracing is basically the idea of limiting the number of traces that we have by making a decision and then applying that decision to all of the spans uh, belonging to the same trace. Right, so we can make the decision either at the very beginning of the data creation, of the telemetry data creation, so at the root span, as we call them. We can apply that at the collector, uh, and we can apply that after the trace has been finished. Um, there is a small difference between the, 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 the second and the third points here uh, that we are going to get later. Now, trace-based sampling, or, or <laughs> Head-based sampling, or just head sampling, um, is applied at the very beginning of the trace. And we typically use a probabilistic strategy for that. Now, we can use other strategies as well. But typically, when we, when we talk about head sampling, we are talking about making a decision based on some probabilistics. Um, so we say that for a service X, we are uh, sampling only on, or we are selecting only 50% of the data that we are creating. Um, and then we use that decision, um, and we include that decision in the context that we propagate down to other spans for that, uh, for that same trace. Now, um, the advantages of doing sampling at the, heads, uh, at the head or at the very beginning of the trace is that we don't have any transmission costs for non-sampled data. Right? So we can still perhaps generate, depending on, on the sampler that we are using, but we are not sending that data out. It's relatively easy to configure. So when you are starting with uh, uh, tracing, you typically are taught how to do sampling uh, for, for your services. Some libraries even come with a sampling already on. right? So they can, uh, they can reduce the amount of data by default. It's harder to apply it consistently, though. I mean, um, while you can configure for a service A, a specific number or a specific probability, you have to make sure, or, or perhaps you want to make sure, that uh, the same strategies are applied to all of your services. And it's harder to apply when you have hundreds of services in there. And perhaps um, the, the, the most <laughs> surprising downside is that um, the probability of 10% does not necessarily mean that we are getting 10% out. Right? So when we say that um, I'm, I'm 
flipping a coin like 10 times, now the probability of getting heads or tails is 50-50, right? Uh, but then the reality is we get 60, uh, six, 6 or 4 or 7 and 3 and so on and so forth. So the probability of 10% is not necessarily 10% output. Uh, we have a second strategy, and that is uh, doing sampling at the collector. And what we can do there is we can apply a decision consistently to all of these pens that are getting there based on the trace ID. So I can hash the trace ID, do a, um, a hash mod n, and then we, we can make a decision consistent for all of these pens within the same trace. So we don't have to keep the trace, the pens in, in memory to apply a decision. The decision is consistent. But then again, we have uh, the same problem with uh, probability. Um, it is easy to configure for all of the services at once, because if we have all of the telemetry data going to the same collector, we can centralize the configuration at that collector and change and tune based on our current needs. Um, it's relatively easy to configure, but it does come with the operational costs of a collector, and the collector is not very cheap to run, right? I mean, you, you have to install, you have to deploy it, you have to maintain, you have to, to, to take care of it. Uh, and again, we have the same problem with uh, statistics. Now, we have a second way of doing sampling at the collector, like tail sampling. Uh, and we typically use that for complex strategies. So we can apply different strategies depending on how the data look like. Um, we can, <laughs> this, um, one of the characteristics of this uh, strategy is that we, can, we have to keep data in memory for some time. So we, we keep all of the data in memory for a specific amount of time. And then once we deem a trace to be ready, then we make a decision based on how the trace look like. What it means is it requires all of these pens to be sent to the same collector. So if we send, if we have like 10 collectors, we are scaling our, our infra. So we have 10 collectors, and I send, um, and I do a wrong uh, robbing uh, load balancing of my data, then it means that parts of my traces are, get, are getting to one collector and parts to another collector. And when I run the decision, uh, I only make a decision based on partial traces. And that decision might be wrong. So it requires, again, all of these pens from the same trace to go to the same collector. Um, advantages are I can really pick um, the exact traces that I want. I can say I want 100% of the errors, for instance. Um, I can apply multiple and complex conditions, so not necessarily only probabilistic strategies, uh, but uh, combine probabilistic with errors and uh, so on and so forth. It does come with even higher operational costs, as you're going to see in a couple of minutes. Um, and by now, you have a stateful collector. And scaling stateful workloads is somewhat harder than uh, stateless. Um, and even, I mean, sampling has downsides as well, right? So it's, you don't use sampling by default, I would say. Um, you only do sampling when you actually need to do sampling, because it's harder to make statistics after the fact. So if you are dropping data out, um, you, don't, you don't get that data back. Um, so if you haven't collected statistics before dropping data, it's very, harder, uh, it's very hard to uh, understand what you actually missed, what you actually uh, uh, threw out. It potentially misses important telemetry data. So if you are waiting like five seconds for data to come in uh, so that you make a decision, and then you probably said, OK, so that trace there looks fine. Uh, it, the latency was very low, and it was just more of the same. So I, I would just drop that data. And then suddenly, uh, you receive a new span for that. Now it becomes interesting. But because you throw that trace out, you don't have that data anymore. So you potentially miss important telemetry. And it is indeed more complex to operate. Now you have to think about a, another layer of collectors doing um, load balancing, for instance, and how can you do that load balancing, um, and so other problems to think about. And now I'll pass it back to Alexandre to say uh, why they needed sampling at Pismo. Hi. Uh, here we have uh, three pillars that uh, why we needed uh, to implement sampling in our case. The exponential growth of the company, and hopefully, hopefully uh, without exponential observability costs, while we keep the visibility of our service. So I will co cover in more details here. Uh, I, I, as I mentioned previously, I work in, at Pismo, and uh, Pismo is a uh, bank a service of providing 
uh, and we have a, a large customer around the world. And it becomes our operations very critical. So we need to have a good ob observability in our service uh, to cover and perform some troubleshoot when problems happen. Here we have uh, some numbers of PISM that uh, the volume of money and the transactions that uh, pass for our platform. Uh, so here we can have idea about the, 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 how much critical is this operation. And the control uh, observability costs. Uh, the, the growth of the company uh, could impact the observability costs. It's uh, sometimes become a, a big challenge to us to control this kind of situation. So uh, the, we've discussed uh, growing very fast. It can impact the margin of the, the, the products that we are uh, sell. Uh, so uh, it's necessary to, to, to take some actions to solve this kind of situation. Keep our uh, uh, services observable. So when we try to implement some kind of sampling, we don't can uh, we cannot lose the visibility of uh, about our workloads. When some kind of error, some kind of crash or incident critical happen, you need to have good data to analyze and perform to troubleshoots and become the recover the, the, the platform as well. And uh, how we did it? Uh, in the, the moment that we decided to implement sampling in our, in our service, we, we had two options on the table. That was head sampling or tail sampling. Uh, how we learned with two, uh, uh, Jurassic previously, head sampling, uh, the decision to store or not the, the traces is, uh, is taken on the beginning of the transaction. So, for this reason, we discard this option because some could could happen that we discard a critical information uh, that can help us to solve some kind of problem. So we choose the tail sampling. Uh, why tail sampling? Tail sampling provides to us a good visibility uh, of uh, our service in case of crash. Uh, find control with policies. You have a lot of possibilities with po policies uh, that you can use in tail sampling. And Tani, uh, the open telemetry as well, there are uh, good metrics that you can analyze and perform an uh, improvement uh, in, in the collector, in the configurations, and perform some turnings uh, that uh, based in the metrics that uh, have, uh, we have available in, in open telemetry collector. Here uh, we have a simple diagram about the, the, the Open Talent, where 100% of the traces of the, the, the applications uh, is sent into our collector, but uh, the policy is applied and just uh, uh, sampling traces are sent for our backend. Here uh, we have some policies that we have implemented. Uh, the first policy uh, is about errors. If some uh, trace has some kind of error, this trace will be stored in, in, in our application. Another possibility is about the, maybe you don't want to implement sampling in specific application, so you can use this policy to, to don't implement sampling for that specific application. Another possibility that we, we have is about the latency. If there are some, some latency uh, happening in your, in your environment, you can store this data to analyze. Uh, in, in, in another moment. And if everything is, is running well, uh, we, you don't have error, latency, or any exception, uh, we will use a probabilistic sampling that will start until 25% of the trace generating our platform. Another session of settings that we have here is about the decision weight. How much time we wait to decide if we will store the trace or not, five seconds. And we store uh, 120,000 uh, trace in the memory. It's possible to, to store this, this number in the memory to take a decision if we will store or not. Uh, 
We don't have a magic number about the number of spans that each trace has. In some situations, we have some traces that has uh, 10 spans, and in other moments, we can have traces with more than 100 uh, uh, spans in the same trace. Here we have the uh, chart showing the volume of uh, spans that is arriving in the and in the collector, uh, how we can see here is something near of 250,000 uh, spans. But when you look for the another chart, you can realize that uh, the volume of spans that we send for our tool is less than 40,000 spans. Uh, so it uh, represents a, a good save money for, for us. Uh, Trade-offs here is uh, the instance of the open telemetry collector is big, but uh, there are some reasons for that. For example, in our case, we have some bad process that uh, uh, run during the night where uh, the collector needs to have a, a memory available to, to handle with this volume. And another uh, situation is in case of incidents, you will store more uh, trace, so it's necessary to, to have a uh, memory available to, to open telemetry collector handle with this volume of trace. So lessons learned that we have here. Uh, that is uh, about the volume of spans that collector can handle. Uh, and we realize that is a big volume of uh, uh, spans that uh, open telemetry can, can handle and uh, works well. Yeah, um, but a collector can only hold um, so much load, right? Uh, so they had uh, 250,000 spans per second. That's quite something. Uh, but then uh, there is some limit. <laughs> um, and they have, after doing vertical um, escalation, scaling of their collectors, they found out recently that um, they hit the limit. And looking at the previous chart, you probably saw like a spike and then a constant load uh, after, uh, during the day. Right? So um, that's also not very optimal usage of the resources. Um, and then now they hit a limit where um, it's harder to scale um, vertically. Now they have to scale um, horizontally as well. So that's the second lesson learned. Even though the collector can take uh, a very high load, uh, there is a point where you have to plan for horizontal scaling. And uh, uh, another lesson that we learned that sometimes can happen that uh, open telemetry collector crash. But it's not a big problem because when uh, uh, open telemetry collector needs to be restarted for any reason, memory, uh, out of memory or some reason, uh, open time collector take it just four seconds to be ready again. So the volume of spans can uh, arrive again in the collector that will be treated and uh, sent to our uh, observability tool. So were anyone here yesterday at Rejects? Yeah. So yeah, we had a, a talk yesterday on, on resiliency of collector pipelines. So um, the previous slide showed that it's OK to crash the collector, or for their uh, case. But uh, of course, the collector provides ways for people to make resilient pipelines as well. Now, the second, uh, the fourth uh, lesson learned is that the probability of 10% is not 10%. So I, I kind of alluded to that at the very beginning. Um, and if you were paying attention to the graphics, um, you saw that they are ingesting 244,000 per second, or that was their peak uh, on that specific time window. And um, if we look at the number of uh, sample data, we got like 39.6K. Um, if we do the math, 39.6K uh, is not 25%, which is what they had as probabilistic sampling. It's 16%. And if we go back to the configuration they had, they had like 100% of errors, 100% of those services in here, 100% of high latency, and 25% of the other things. So I would intuitively um, think that we get more than 25%. 
but it's not really the case. It's only 16, right? So, and I, and I, I I'm going to be honest with you. When I saw the, those numbers here, I came to Magan and said, that, that, that's wrong. I mean, I would expect 25, I mean, to be roughly 25. And he said, no, no, yeah, we looked into that. And it's really like 16. It's, uh, we increase and we decrease and we can see the effects. But, um, and of course, there is other situation there where uh, we specify a percentage of traces. But then the, within the traces, we have a different number of, of spans. So, and the numbers that we have here are spans, right? So what it means is we get 16% um, of the spans being sampled, but that is uh, not telling how many, um, how many traces were actually sampled. And uh, the last lesson that we learned is about uh, uh, our currently policy that we have implemented uh, at Pismo. Uh, it's simple to detect when some kind of uh, incident is happening because the volume of traces is stored in the, the tool uh, raises so fast uh, and imagine that a critical incident uh, will be stored more and more trace and you can, uh, the simple way, analyze the chart, for example, and detect that uh, the time of the problem starts and you can analyze based in good information because the the most part of information that will be stored is about errors and uh, as we know when we are trying to perform some troubleshoot we look for errors and here is the results of after the full implementation of the sampling in our company this is the chart of the financial team team of the pismo and we can realize that we are saving a lot of money here. And uh, the size of Pismo today is much more than when we, we implemented. So uh, it's complicated to imagine where is uh, discussed today because uh, the volume of transactions that we have today is much more than previously, for example, on 2022 year, for example. And the next steps, uh, as, as you realize that our instance of uh, open telemetry is big, but not necessarily to keep big for the all day. So we will implement a load balancer, uh, because today we don't use load balancer, but it will be implemented and implemented HPA to scale in case of uh, we need to, to scale automatically. It will be bring more uh, save money for us in terms of instance uh, to uh, uh, host the open telemetry collector. So it's all that uh, I, I would like to thank you for everyone. And uh, if you have some question, please let us know. We have microphones here on the sides. Um, yeah, I have a quick question. Given you're in, in banking, did most of the sampling that you did not involve money movement as far as needing to keep uh, transactional data? Did you do, mainly do non-critical pathways? Uh, well, uh, the most part of data uh, um, is not so relevant for analyzing some kind of problem because we have logs in a good level of detail. So uh, logs complement the trace. So we don't lose a, a, a data, critical data. We can search uh, something in, at logs and we, we will find. Uh, just to share, uh, we have a good strategy in terms of logs that we uh, get the CID, correlation ID of the transaction, and it will be uh, set in all uh, line logs of the all applications. So if we need to perform some troubleshoot, detect something, we can just get the CID and we can have our details in, in based in logs. But for traces, we have a, a tool where we can analyze the specific request for database, Elastic Cache and uh, any other endpoint. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for this great talk. Uh, just 
can you go back to lesson four? Because I was wondering on the probabilistic anomaly, because the interesting part here, the max indeed has this weird thing, but the mean is actually quite nicely 25%. And that makes sense, right? Because maximums are very sensitive to probabilistic anomalies, while the mean isn't. So yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure about the conclusion, because it really, in the mean, it's 25%, and that's the overall period you're looking at. Yeah, uh, so that's, um, so I guess the point is um, you are configuring 25%, uh, but it's not necessarily going to be 25%. So it might be at most of the time, but then you have to account for those, uh, those movements. Right? So it is 19, 16% uh, uh, if we compare just the peaks. But uh, yeah, I mean, ideally it would be around 25. Yeah, but in, in, in your case, I don't know what the, the time frame was where you took this. this I think that was one day, right? One day. So at, at one day, you're at exactly 25%. Yeah, I think that's one day. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, um, you should, you should, we should aim for 25, and that's um, data should be within that close to that range, but uh, it might not. Right, so I guess that's the, especially because, and I think the, 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 the um, when I was looking at that data, uh, the, what I thought was we are filtering traces. So it might be 25% of the traces. And I would hope that uh, the number of traces and uh, the number of spans within traces would uh, be almost the same throughout the day. Uh, and that might not be the case, right? So perhaps the traces that are generated from batches, they have more or less spans than the ones that are transactional throughout the day. So the sampling that we apply there might affect the, the, the number for the end of the day. But yeah, I mean, over a longer, the longer we, we look at the data, uh, the closer to 25 it should be. Yeah. Yes. Thanks. Uh, quick question. One claim I remember hearing a few years ago uh, at a similar presentation was that for at least using an open source backend where, where the customer has to pay for the processing of traces, so Jaeger, for example, the claim was that it, for computed memory costs, tail-based sampling would be roughly equivalent to just sending them all the way into the backend and processing them. Can you speak to the amount of compute you had to throw at the collector to achieve these gains? It looks like it was quite low, which is good. Um, I'll let him answer most of the question, uh, but um, so they had to have this big of a of a collector, like so, 25 CPUs and 56 gigs of RAM, uh, so that's quite beefy. Um, but then they were paying, where is the, yeah, so they were paying like almost 80k a month, um, and they went down to 15k a month with that collector. Right, so that's, um, I would expect a collector of that size not to cost what, um, s such many case. Yeah. Okay. Right. Perfect. But, uh, Perfect. Yeah, but perhaps. No, sir, but yeah. All right. Good. Thank you, guys. Um, how did you get to the number of 15 seconds and 120k of traces? Uh, it was based in our tests, for example. Uh, Five seconds for us is a uh, high latency because everything, uh, every transaction in bank must be done in, in milliseconds. So, five seconds is almost incident for us. So this is a good number to to have, uh, and the volume of traces that we have uh, stored in memory, in case uh, 120,000 traces is based in the critical moments. For example, bad process running that uh, running during the, the night and in case of incidents. When, when we have some kind of incidents, is, uh, the customer performed, uh, uh, he try and he try and the volume of requests is, is raising so fast. So it was necessary to put a, a big number to, 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 to be able to handle with the volume of data and storing our tool. Got it, got it. But you, you mentioned like some batch operations uh, working during night. Like, and if you have any like operation that's taking more than five seconds, but like it's maybe a reporting generation, for example, you want to trace this. Uh, you are you going to lose these traces because this will be fragmented? Like, how this is 
be handled? No, it's, it's not fragmented, uh, but the, the volume of uh, the memory that we allocate for the, the, the collector is necessary because we have a bad process, but there are transactions happening in the same moment. Okay. So to guarantee the, tra the, the transactions that is running in that moment is necessary to, to allocate memory for this, these situations. So to address part of your question, um, we, we have a feature request and we are, well, since like forever, but uh, the idea is uh, to record on a cache the decision for a specific trace. Uh, so if we have a trace that with a decision to trace, or to sample, sorry, uh, then we, we look at the cache and we send that data in. And if the decision was not to sample, then we drop this, this data based on decisions that were made more than five seconds ago. Uh, it is only a cache, so data can be, you know, after some time, it is going to disappear. But it is something that we have on the roadmap for the load balancing, uh, sorry, for the tail sampling processor. That's good. So this means that my trace might, might take longer than the, my, this time decision? Data that you lost, you lost. Uh, but if you made a decision, that decision is going to be applied consistently to the new or to the late, uh, late spans. Cool. Thank you, guys. All right. Okay. Yeah, we are out of time, so. One question, so you're talking about uh, a scaling of the stateful sets, right? So the question is, how often do you plan to scale out those uh, stateful collectors? And how do you plan to handle the statefulness of those collectors, right? I mean, when, when a new collector gets added or removed, then you, you need to ensure that the spans of a particular trace goes to the right set of uh, collectors, right? Um, the way that the, so, you would apply the load balancing exporter in front of your, like a layer of la load balancing exporters, and then the second layer is the, same, the tail sampling processor. So the tail sampling processor would not know about that change in the topology. The load balancing exporter would. But then once you apply a new topology, then you get data that is sent to a new location, if that's the case. So there are some algorithms on the load balancing exporter making it um, change only by 30% of the trace ID uh, range. So only 30% 30, 30 would be affected by topology change uh, if it changes by one. But then we are trying to come up with a solution similar to making a cache of decisions for tail sampling. We are thinking about the same for the load balancing exporter as well. So that when a decision is made for a specific trace ID, that decision is consistently applied uh, in the future for other traces, no matter the topology. And how often do you expect it to scale out or scale in? What is that? How often do you expect it to scale out or scale in? Uh, the outscale, we, we will implement based in memory utilization. So we will set the number of the, the, the uh, collector that can scale, and based in the memory utilization, uh, we will scale or not. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you very much, and uh, enjoy the conference. <laughs>